Welcome to your America's Cup show, Beyond the Cup. This is the final edition, and it's coming from the Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron Library, where Team New Zealand have retained the old mug. It is sitting just outside the door uh, in its sparkling glory. A 7-3 win over Luna Rossa. We've assembled a stellar cast for you today from Luna Rossa. Great to have Shannon Falcone back, a grinder on board the boat, and of course a two times America's Cup winner with Oracle in your sixth campaign. Shirley Robertson from America's Cup TV, great to have you here for the first time as part of the World Feed, a two-time Olympic gold medalist. Marco Orams, our ever-present uh, expert analyst, and another Olympic gold medalist, uh, Paul Goodison, uh, multiple world champion, of course, part of the American Magic team for this uh, regatta. Thanks so much for your time as well. Now, this is Beyond the Cup. I'm Matt Brown. Let's get straight into it. Shannon Falcone, how's it been for you in, in the last couple of days? Obviously, you know, some tremendous disappointment, but uh, how are you feeling now? I mean, I think ultimately um, I was fortunate enough to sort of experience this campaign um, in a way that was different for me not being on the boat, um, ups and downs. But I can tell you that our after party uh, definitely beat the Team New Zealand after party, so that was a, uh, a strange one there. No, no, as Max says, keep pushing. And the reality is, uh, what we can gain here, we'll gain going forward, because the idea for Luna Rosa is to unpack the gear, win back in Calgary, and just keep ticking into the next one. It did sound like a pretty good after party. My apartment's just above the Luna Rossa base. I think it was like half past two, our little guys peering through the window to try and see what was going on. I was on. dragging my kids back, like a four-year-old and eight-year-old, they were just spraying champagne at midnight, like just all in the forecourt. So it was, uh, no, it was definitely a good one. And great to hear too that uh, you know Patrizio Bertelli is very keen on, on continuing the Luna Rossa dynasty, the association with Prada and the America's Cup. I think the importance, I mean, we may, might not feel it here in New Zealand, but what the, the team did back in Italy uh, for you know the difficulty of, as a nation, what they're experiencing also through COVID and so on is just, it's just just generated such a huge following. I mean, Italians are passionate uh, sports at, for any sports, but usually it's always been about football. Um, Luna Rossa did something 20 years ago, but I think from here they really picked it and put it to another level. And uh, I think the whole team is really excited to get back to Italy just to really uh, say thank you and understand really what the changes that they've done. Shirley Robertson, from a sailor's <coughs> perspective, how incredible has this America's Cup campaign been and, uh, and what do you think of those AC-75s? Oh, I mean, like most of the sailing world, I couldn't really see how they would even work when they were first introduced. And, and when we arrived here in December, I remember the first day out in the water just seeing them fly by. And it, it, an extraordinary moment, really. It, a massive leap in, in technology and refinement. And it was so impressive. And I think the thing as a sailor that impressed, impressed us so much was I guess how these guys got to grips with them and as every day went by they they tamed the beast didn't they they managed to to really introduce you know match racing skills and it got tighter and tighter as they sailed them better and better and you know that for the television that was a joy I mean every day we saw improvement every day we had a story and uh, it was you know it was great television. Goody in our America's Cup match preview show right here you predicted a 7-3 scoreline in the match was uh, was as you thought it would pan out i think i was being a bit optimistic <laughs> when i when i made the 7-3 quote but i think it was similar to what we uh, what we thought it would be i think the the lighter conditions obviously kept the racing really close and tight i think the the one thing that everybody's left thinking is like what would have happened if it would have been 15 knots we don't really know the the true potential of the New Zealand boat, how close would it have been? Would they have sailed away with it? And, and that's the part that's left me really intrigued. Wow, what if, like we heard all these rumors and talks of how amazingly fast this boat was in the upper wind ranges. But the thing that really surprised me is, is how well the, uh, the smaller foils managed the lighter winds um, and just how forgiving the Luna Rossa boat was and, and how well those guys sailed the boat to put a lot of pressure on Team New Zealand. Marco, we've had a couple of days now to sort of digest this event. And Team New Zealand's performance on the water, they just got better, didn't they, from the very start of that match to the end, as what we kind of expected they would. Yeah, the, the, the phrase I use is the relentless pursuit of continuous improvement. That's been the ethos that's driven Emirates Team New Zealand, uh, and they've just continued that on. They have been relentless. And if you look every single race, 
they refine things, little changes, just try to get better in the way they sail the boat, the decisions that they make, the communication, the setup and the moding of the boat. If you look at some of the, uh, the replays, you can just notice subtle changes from one race to the next and they just got better and better and better. And the results reflect that. Five straight wins to finish their defense of the 36th America's Cup, really impressive. Well, lots of questions and answers. I caught up with Aaron Young, the Commodore of the Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron, to find out what's next for the America's Cup. Well, we're standing in front of the old mug, and Aaron Young, the Commodore of the Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron, let's look at it. I mean, it must be just fantastic to, to have it back in its rightful place. Very, very satisfying. I walked up yesterday morning uh, after the night before, and uh, very cool feeling to see it back in what we call its home. And you've got some big news. Uh, a challenge has been lodged, it's been accepted. Who is it? Well, the Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron has accepted a challenge from the Royal Yacht Squadron in the UK uh, for the 37th America's Cup. OK, um, that's fantastic news. Um, what other details uh, have been announced today? Well, there's a lot to work through yet. Uh, we have a number of months to work through and um, a lot of details. But uh, the main thing, I guess, right now is we'll be sailing you know, the same boats, AC-75s, uh, we should see them out again, you know, hopefully in New Zealand. And I didn't speak to anybody over the last couple of few months who, who, who weren't keen on that idea. I mean, that's just fantastic, isn't it? Because uh, they really, uh, you know, have revolutionised the sport. Well, they've changed the sport a lot for, you know, for the average person and made it probably more relatable and um, more exciting. And uh, the America's Cup's always been about innovation and, you know, technology as much as sailing. And uh, the AC-75's done that. And in terms of from a yacht squadron perspective, I mean obviously you'd love to see the old mug raced on home waters. Um, how long will it be before we kind of know uh, what is going to happen with the 37th America's Cup? number of months yet I, I suspect. Um, I think as we all know the, uh, the, you know, the, the, the option sits with New Zealand to uh, see if we can put something together to enable us to race the 37th America's Cup in, in Auckland. But there is a lot to work through and there's a lot of, um, you know, yeah, for and against, I guess you could say. So how do you market this um, over the next uh, wee while? Do you get it around the country? Well, in 2017, we took it on a country tour uh, once we won on Bermuda. So, you know, hopefully we'll be able to do that again, um, COVID, you know, permitting and that sort of thing. But it's, it's great, I think, to take to New Zealand, take to the people of New Zealand just to see what it's all about and understand a little bit of the America's Cup. Congratulations on getting the deal done. Congratulations on retaining the old mug. Yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate it. So the challenger of record has been confirmed as the Royal Yacht Squadron who are based at Cowes on the Isle of Wight. I think that's your home, your hometown. Uh, you literally look out on, on the race course if there is in fact a future uh, match race there, Shirley. Yeah, if anyone wants to rent a house, <laughs> we've got one. I mean, it's really exciting news for, for British sailing fans uh, and obviously, you know, suggests that, that Ben Ainsley is, is up and running for another edition. So, you know, great news there. Jim Radcliffe, um, I mean, it, this was his first go, and, and, and he's not a sailor, you know, he has, he's been out in his big super yacht here, but he's not, he's not a sailor, so it's not really in his DNA, but it, it seems like he's been really bitten by the America's Cup bug, and he's a man used to winning, he's obviously other sports properties, you know, the cycling team, he's involved in Formula One, and I think it's great news for the Cup that he's really investing in the future of it, and you know, it's an exciting prospect if you're, if you're a British Cup fan. And news too that the AC75s will be continued, um, surely there will be more teams, which was probably the one criticism of the regatta, not enough uh, challenges. The more teams, that, well, I mean, it's great news, first of all, that all four teams who are involved in this edition kind of look like they're going to be back. More teams is potentially quite tricky with the nationality rules, and there's a balance there. And obviously for Team New Zealand, it's important. You don't want your team to be, you know, poached all around the world. So the nationality rule is, is good for them. They're strong, incredible dynasty of, of sailors here. But if you're, you know, if you're from Sweden, Goody was with Artemis last time, it's a bit of a challenge. Isn't it? And also, you know, to to build up and to train in, you know, it's dark a lot of the time in a country like Sweden. It, it's it's pretty hard for other countries. So I don't know if there'll be any more additions. There's obviously talk, you know, there's doc gossip about Ernesto Bertarelli coming back with an Alinghi syndicate. But you know, let's wait and see. That's what the cup's all about, isn't it? It's. But I mean, there's two things, two points you brought up there, which I think we've forgotten about regarding the number of teams and um, I think how close teams are. 
we forget that, I mean, back in 2007, where everyone looks at, you know, how many teams there were and how close Racing could have been. But the reality is it wasn't that close. And it took 15 years mm. of class development to get to that area in the box where you had that. Here, we've done it nearly in one generation. And the reality is with the tools and the tech and all that stuff, we get to similar speeds much quicker. We've never had that opportunity to go to a second iteration of a class in the last 10 years to allow that sharing of IP, of ideas, of whether people move between teams. And I think if we did allow you know, another generation of AC75, you'd see the bar raised. Because you know what's, where the bar was set, in a way. You know? uh, so I think, you'd I think see that's, much a, that's a great point. As soon as new teams come around, or the, the people move between the teams, the, a lot of the IP is shared. So all the teams almost share the learning from the other teams. So the second generation, everybody's got similar ideas because they have them from all four teams and then the boats will get better and better and better and, and hopefully closer and closer and closer. And, and the, the more challengers back then was because you had boats, you know, smaller teams would take first generation boats and hopefully you know, that could happen. I think with regard to the nationality clause, uh, while I, I would support it with regard to the sailing crew, I think allowing some flexibility for, for the rest of the team to bring in uh, experienced people from other nations to help coach and build the capability of a local nation sailing community, particularly at America's Cup level, would be a really important thing. Um, one of the problems with a, a really open nationality clause is you do have sailors from other countries come in and then work on the sailing crew and then they move on. So that doesn't really build the capability within a particular nation. Whereas if you allowed a nationality clause where you had the great majority of the sailing crew from that country of origin, but you allowed the coaches uh, and others who can bring in the experience and expertise needed to build the capability of that challenging nation, that would be a good way forward for the Cup. Shirley, you've been part of the international broadcast team and I'm pretty sure you were out on the water just about every day. Can you just give us uh, an idea in terms of the scale of the coverage um, you know, globally? I have to apologise for us to Shannon Falcone. Every morning, nearly, it felt I was trying to get a dramatic quote out of you <laughs> for the top of the programme. <laughs> and you would face me think, oh, God, what, what can I say that, that's different? Yeah, yeah, big, punchy one-liner. And the scale of this broadcast has been extraordinary. And I hope, I hope the viewers really think we did a good job. I and mean, the assets available were incredible. We had uh, you know, two helicopters with you know, state-of-the-art gyro-stabilised, massive big cameras. Uh, and also two purpose-built catamarans on the water, so they're lovely and stable with the same cameras. So four, you know, four massive cameras, as well as all the onboard Kiwi cameras. Tech, by the, way. The, the cases are Kiwi, a Kiwi shot over, <laughs> a plug to a Kiwi company, um, and all the onboard cameras as well. And for me, like one of the big breakthroughs here was the onboard audio, and particularly actually on the British boat, it was so. It was so clear, and as a sailor, I mean, we just soaked that in. It was so great to hear, you know, to hear all the comms. So a massive scale, 80 people, state of the art, everything. I mean, for sailing, it, it properly raised the bar in terms of in terms of coverage. Shannon, how much uh, a role does the comms uh, play on the boat in terms of picking up that analysis? Uh, it really is so clear. Uh, a big part of it. I mean, we have a great team: Philippe Presti, Jacopo Plazzi, um, our performance guys. Even between races, you know, they'll be watching the individual feeds from the other boats, and might already have feedback that we can already bring into, um, you know, into the next race of what was going on, decision making, all that stuff. And at night, you know, um, we'll be watching the full replays of the other boats, and usually we would have all different, all the different cameras, and on board and audio. And the most interesting part is listening to the onboard audio of other teams, whether it's within pre-start or at critical decisions, you know, where things change and you did something different. It's always interesting to know what the other team was thinking of doing at that, that moment. So it's a big part of it, and I'm sure it's the same with the other teams. Like, you sift through all of that stuff, and we have a really good team of guys that, that does that. So the importance is we can bring that into effect, not even the next day, but even the next race. It's also a real strength to analyse and improve your own communication. Yeah, 100%. You're looking at the other teams, how are they communicating at what's the critical times for them. But it also brings back a lot to, to help you analyse your performance. Where could we be a little bit better about noticing this? Where should the comms be coming? Should they be coming earlier? Who should be communicating this? It's a really useful tool, not only for analysing the other teams, but also for improving Yourself. yourselves. I mean, all of this stuff, like you said, as he's saying, 
for the critical guys at the back of the boat when that decision making process has to has to start and these boats are going so fast that you're not thinking about what's next but already two moves ahead kind of thing so um, big part of it. Well Marco um, you know the comms certainly are extraordinary to, to hear and to listen to what's it like from a fan's perspective do you think? Oh, I just think it adds so much value to the event because uh, sailing is quite a cerebral sport it, some people have characterised it as a, a game of chess on the water and so the ability to actually listen in to the decision making, all of the factors that go into the complexity of the sport uh, just adds so much from a fan perspective. And, and the feedback that I've received from people is non-sailors are just captivated uh, by the sport. And uh, there are very few other examples I can think of at, at elite sport where you're actually able to tap into the real time decision making and communication that's going on board in a highly technical and, and very cerebral sport that is sailing. Mm, very good point indeed. Uh, Shannon Falconi, I just want to touch back on Luna Rossa and, and the whole experience with the dual helmsman because that was quite revealing very early on uh, in, this, in this America's Cup. Jimmy Spittle and Francesco Bruni, their relationship, two very different personalities, but they, they just seem to work so well together. I mean, it wasn't an easy call to make, and you know, Max and as a sailing team, it was something that we discussed because it's all start starts from the drawing board. You know, how you set up the boat and how we thought we would use the boat and so on, and in crew positioning and roles and, and all that kind of stuff. And the reality was, it was something that we bet on early, and it took time to sort of bring to fruition under the pressure of racing. We needed that, and it was really good to see that all the way through the through the series, but. It's always that pros and cons, you know, you've got the people that say, ah, oh, the helmsman only helms half the time on the water, hours actually driving the boat. But on, you know, on the other side of the coin, you've got, it's like two boat testing in a way, because you've got feedback from two people. And that's something that I feel we forget sometimes, where it's really good to have different perspectives. Um, and it's really difficult to get someone else to jump on, who's, who could be like Goody could easily jump on the helm. But if he hasn't been driving the boat throughout that whole period, to, to, to give the feedback on the changes as they develop, it's really difficult. So I think we saw that and it was really good because we're all competitive, but I think having two people that aren't fighting against each other but working together, you know, you'd always see whether it was, you know, trimming the, because ultimately what people forget is the performance of the boat isn't so much actually the guy who's on the helm at that time. It's the guy that's on the other side, you know, flying the boat. That's a, that's a great point. The more stable the boat is in the attitude, the more accurate the flight controller is, the faster the boat goes. Yeah, so, so, so they had to work in absolute perfect symbiosis, the two of them, and that was something that they both really worked at, and that was thanks also to Philippe, uh, Matteo Ledri in performance, like just analyzing the style of flight, the style of how they drove, because they're two totally different sailors, as, as we all know. It was interesting that there was a lot of talk, Shannon, about the, the it's an innovation, right? In sailing, it's very rare that you would have this, in fact, I can't even think of an example where you split 50-50, the helming duties like that. Uh, there was a lot of talk of it, certainly through the Prada Cup, but it seemed to become a non-factor during the America's Cup. It wasn't even discussed. And, and what it sort of showed to me is that both teams had really perfected their use of the system they chose, and that there are, yes, advantages and disadvantages to, uh, of each, but both teams were aware of those and were able to compensate for the disadvantages and to maximise the advantages. So in the end, it, it wasn't a difference uh, in terms of winning or losing. I mean, I agree. I think, you know, we always thought pre-starts were going to be an important part, going back to the, you know, up when, you know, up when pre, you know, pre-starts. And, and we felt we had a strength in two great match racers. Uh, the visibility that we had on our boat for that. It was something that, you know, we always went for and pushed for. And, and I think, you know, someone that's, I, mean, I think within the same community, we all know, but the work that Philippe, you know, did with them and so on was also a big part of it. And I think for our, also our, our new generation of sailors that are coming through and the, the morning meetings before every race where it's dissecting, you know, what we feel the, the Kiwis could do, would do, how Pete and Blair you know, and Glenn would, would react or work. And they, I'm sure with Ray, they do the same thing back to us, but it's, uh, it's been a really cool process. And, uh, you know, uh, I hope it continues. Goody, this is like the Formula One on water. These are the fastest ever yachts to be built. Where do you see these AC-75s developing from here? I think these are incredible boats. The speed is phenomenal, but we're always running up the cavitation barrier. At some point, you're not going to go too much faster just from a, 
from a sheer physics side of things. But I think what's been the most impressive part for me of the last three, six months of these boats is how good the manoeuvres have become. Like before, your decision making is all down to uh, he's going to manoeuvre here, he's not going to be able to manoeuvre again for another 20 or 30 seconds and he's going to lose this amount of distance. There's none of that now. You can pretty much drop the board when you want, you turn when you want, there's no setup time or very little setup time. And the, the losses in manoeuvres are so small. And I think there's, there's still room for improvement. The boats are going to get, get faster. They're going to become even more controllable. And I think it's just become, going to become phenomenal racing. The, uh, the speeds they do is incredible. And the, uh, and the ability to sail them, people are just getting better and better. They're learning the boats and it's, uh, it's a pretty cool place for the sport right now. And Shirley Robertson, uh, you were a gold medalist, I think, at the Sydney Olympics, Athens Olympics. Uh, you're no stranger to these waters here in New Zealand, but I'm sure you'd love to come back. Have you had a great time the last few months? It's been amazing. I mean, a bit like the guys, I feel pretty privileged to have been part of it all. And what a show New Zealand put on. I mean, as a broadcaster, also some amazing highlights. And you know, every day, especially early on, we didn't really know what was going to happen. And every day brought some, brought some drama. We had great characters, you know, Ben Ainsley versus Jimmy Spiddle, and, and later on Pete Burling and, and Jimmy and Kecko. And, uh, it, it was fantastic really to grow with the teams as well. I mean, the learn, our learning and their learning just, just grew you know, at a really rapid rate. So a very special cup. Every cup has its own, own nuances and great memories, but here, you know, amazing memories. Um, and I'll never forget actually when I was at the New Zealand base when the boat came in and when it turned the corner to come into the viaduct and the noise was amazing and that's you know a memory that I'll that I'll always have so pretty privileged to be here. Well Paul Goodison just an overall sort of summary of your, of your time in Auckland uh, with American Magic. I've had a great time it's been uh, tremendous to be here in Auckland when when most of the rest of the world is kind of on hold at the moment it's been a phenomenal regatta I think looking back one of my big um, I guess downsides to it all there wasn't that much racing and I feel like it would have been so much better if we could have had more racing, more regattas, and, and more preparation for the for the uh, for the Prada Cup. But um, I think we had a good campaign. One small mistake came and bit us so hard, and uh, and just put us out of action for for that critical amount of time when we needed to develop, we needed to get better. And Luna Rossa did such an amazing job of improvements from the weekend of our cup size to when we met them 12 days later in the in the semi-finals. We were we were racing a different boat and. Uh, and we didn't stand that much chance. But uh, looking back, it's been a phenomenal time. I really enjoyed my time in New Zealand. I really hope the Cup comes back here again, and I really hope I get another shot. Shannon Falcone, I imagine you're going to say a similar thing, but, uh, but just, just, just summarise the last uh, few months for you. I think it's a big thank you to New Zealand because you know, Pete touches on the fact to have more racing. I know it wasn't the plan. You know, we were meant to have these events prior to coming to New Zealand. The reality is with COVID, it didn't happen. So the fact that the event even continued ahead, if it was anywhere else, that wouldn't have happened. So that's a big thanks to hopefully to New Zealand to, to give us this paradise that we can continue to live life and race and you know, do what we love to do. Um, as a campaign, it's been an amazing campaign in Luna Rosa. So this is my third with them. Um, I know, you know, big thanks to Patrizio and, and all those guys that are you know, you're talking about you're talking about individuals who love the cup, and that's the crazy thing about our sport. You always pull these people in, and he's someone who's been pulled in for over two decades. And the fact that he still wants to continue is a is a big deal. And um, looking forward to the next chapter. You know, with what Team New Zealand and Royal New York Squadron, uh, you know, decide to do. Well, thanks so much to, uh, to yourself, Shirley, to Shannon, also to Goody, and of course, Mark Orams, who's been with us for every edition of Beyond the Cup. Also, Bianca Cook, around the world sailor, part of the team, Thor Robertson, world champion sailor too. Uh, all good things come to an end. Uh, very sad to be saying this is the final edition of Beyond the Cup, which is still New Zealand's Cup.